and we have the CEO and founder of Ledger Domain, Ben Taylor, here today, who is going to give his presentation on XATP, and we, oh, as, as a product of Ledger Domain, and uh, please, Ben, take it away. Fantastic. Thanks very much, and uh, I appreciate that uh, introduction, Mike. Um, what we're going to talk about today are the three projects that we've worked on that are publicly known about. The last one, XATP, is still in stealth mode, and I see some of our partners, like Mike Karhoff, on the line. Um, we're just going to talk about that from a sort of satellite view level, about sort of the things that we're trying to achieve, and then once we come out completely, um, and we're done with our white paper and everything that Mike's working on with Alex. Um, we're going to be able to talk about that. But I think that for today, um, what I'd like to make sure we cover is, you know, what within the Hyperledger universe makes healthcare a challenge? Uh, what's important? What's going on there? What are some of the new features that people are talking about? And the goal is to give something back to the Hyperledger community as people think about their own challenges. Um, and how they might solve them for themselves. Um, for those of you that um, have followed this area carefully, um, we gave a talk at the beginning of this year to the um, supply chain SIG. Um, and then we also, uh, with Marta's help, uh, gave a chat at the uh, Global Forum. Those are available, and uh, Alex can put those into the chat for people that are interested in drilling down on kit chain and Bruin chain, uh, which are a little bit more focused on each of those areas. Um, but let's just talk a little bit about what makes healthcare a challenge. First of all, I think that privacy has become a third rail issue um, here in America and around the world. Uh, and we've always had HIPAA here, which is a relatively weak privacy law. But in Europe, they passed GDPR, which is a much stronger privacy law. And then in California, we just passed the second and sterner uh, privacy law, probably the toughest in the world. Uh, and that did pass earlier this month. So we're really on a push here to make privacy preservation a critical part of every blockchain system. But in healthcare, there's broad agreement uh, that that has to be done. The one tricky part that I would point out to everybody is that there is no global regulator. So the FDA is a terrific regulatory group here in the U.S. that regulates um, the U.S. interests, but again, they don't necessarily have the ability to influence um, other countries. And so therefore, now that we've globalized our supply chain, We've got to make sure that we're respectful um, of people's privacy outside the U.S. And of course, many, many European visitors come to the U.S. to get health care, and we have to respect their rights as well. Second thing is healthcare data science is a morphing, huge, and dynamic area. Obviously, we're born with this enormous genomic profile that we all have. Um, but everybody's having constantly adjusted immunological um, data. We're gonna, hopefully all of us present are gonna have new immunological data as we get our vaccines uh, in the first quarter, knock on wood. Um, and so we're talking about a ton of data uh, for each and every one of us. Uh, the next thing that's critical to healthcare are role-based privileges. Obviously you only want your doctor or your nurse to see certain information. Um, but at the same time, it's just as important that the FedEx driver is able to get the drugs from the manufacturer to the wholesaler. And he or her, she needs to find out what they need to find out. Um, third, fourth point that I would make is that the supply chain abstractions in healthcare are tricky. Many people know that blockchain and supply chain don't go together very easily. It's not a simple thing to do. In the healthcare area, it's compounded by the fact that you don't necessarily want everybody to know what's going on at every step. People want to have data confidentiality, but in addition, there's many things that you wouldn't want people to know. You don't need for your DHL driver to know that he's carrying OxyContin. Um, 
and uh, at the same time, he needs to understand what risks he's got to manage. The fifth point that I'll talk about is exception handling for ground truth. In fully digital blockchains like Bitcoin, the truth is in the chain. It is a digital system. And if someone gets done out of the pizza that they bought with their Bitcoin, it's tough. You know, the Bitcoin is what is the permanent record. But in healthcare, obviously, the ground truth lies with the patient and with the drug. And so even if somebody can hack uh, a blockchain, at the end of the day, if the um, bottle of pills is behind the counter at the Walmart pharmacy, it's not as if I can walk into the store and say, hey, here's my blockchain record that says that that's my bottle of pills. I'm quite certain that the Walmart pharmacist is not going to hand that bottle of pills across the counter. In fact, he's going to want to make sure that the blockchain gets adjusted to reflect that. He needs to be able to report this to the relevant authority at Walmart and so they can escalate it appropriately. Privacy conserving hooks are very important. All of us have read about um, the surveillance economy and all of us are well aware that we sort of trade, make a trade when we participate in things like Facebook and that Facebook can open up a back door and get a lot of information on us and share it and sell it. But in the um, healthcare world, that's not kosher. But what you do want to be able to have are the hooks that enable you to send out notifications to people and to do your machine learning on an anonymized basis. The seventh thing I would highlight is identity authentication. In the financial services world, we typically call this Know Your Customer or KYC. This is now getting into the healthcare area, probably 15 years late, but nonetheless, it's very critical. And that's part of what XATP is all about. But for those of you that have studied this topic outside of healthcare and you think of it as KYC, I would tell you that it's just an extended KYC concept. So typically KYC is a one layer concept. So if I'm a hedge fund manager and I'm bringing in a new partner, I have to do the KYC and the OFAC check. Um, and in turn, I have to represent to my prime broker that I have accomplished that. Um, in this case, there's a look through process where you might not ever ever done business with a dispenser uh, and you want to find out um, something from a manufacturer, you have to be able to show them, and this is the next point, with a credentialed message that you're a legit person and that you are part of the community and you're by law and under statute, one of the five privileged classes to participate that they call ATPs. So the punchline here is that move fast and break things doesn't really apply to humans and healthcare and that you've got to be careful, you've got to do your testing, you've got to do your validation, and you've got to be aware of all of these issues. Let's see. So this is Ledger Domain. Uh, we focus on the healthcare vertical. We primarily um, build on top of Hyperledger Fabric and are a longtime member of Hyperledger. We're also members of PDG and the GS1 Healthcare Initiative. And we do work both on the clinical supply side uh, with players like Pfizer, IQVIA, Merck, GSK, Thermo Fisher, um, and Biogen, which has been a terrific partner. Um, and that's where you're doing a clinical study. What's important about those things is that you're effectively trying to test something out like a vaccine. And in that case, you would test out the live vaccine uh, versus salt water in a syringe half people getting each, and you have to keep track in a blinded way. Not, neither the doctor nor the patient is supposed to know who got what vaccine. And then you can test these things out and see who got sick. In terms of the commercial supply side, the FDA encouraged us about a year and a half ago to take a look at that. And that we did that work with UCLA again and Biogen. And that's in a peer review journal that you can look up. So let's talk about the clinical supply side first. And uh, if you can't hear the sound, please speak up. Hi, Jen Colon from UCLA Health here. 
Chester Jesus and I were pleased to serve on the working group to share a site's perspective on blockchain's potential benefits to the clinical supply chain. Under Chad and Imran's leadership, we worked as a team to demonstrate a simple use case that reduces site burden while enhancing data integrity. UCLA currently supports about 700 active studies from over 100 sponsors, most with our own proprietary systems. Since it's impossible and insecure to install and train 300 pharmacists on all of these systems, we're forced to fall back on paper documentation. But with a secure, collaborative blockchain system, we can give your medicines the care they require and get them to the patients who need them. Now let's turn it over to Victor from Ledger Domain. Thanks, Jen. Today we're going to hitchhike a ride with Chad as he sends a shipment notification to Jen at UCLA. For the pilot program, messages with simulated data were prepared for testers to send. In a real-world application, these XML messages will be created by the shippers leveraging existing systems. As the message is uploaded to Chad's assigned lockbox on an encrypted server, an authentication hash is generated and sealed into the blockchain, so it's impossible for the document to be secretly altered or falsified. All of this is handled by Ledger Domain Salvage Server. Chad can also share the message with a third party who has visibility into the shipping status, but can't make changes to it. Over on Jen's phone, she receives a notification that the shipment is on its way to UCLA. Opening the message, she can see details about the shipment. Once the shipment arrives, she hits the check mark to confirm receipt. Back on Chad's phone, we see that Jen has received the shipment. By harnessing the power of blockchain, KitChain makes it possible to upload, share, and control access to messages with confidence, all in a way that's secure and unforgeable. Today's KitChain pilot shows you advanced shipment notices and proofs of delivery going to the right stakeholders in real time. With GS1's new barcodes and role-based privileges, the next generation of KitChain will source messages from multiple systems and securely route them to the people and systems that need them across the clinical supply ecosystem. Hi, Jen Colon from UC. So again, just to summarize what you saw, this is, isn't often talked about, um, I don't think in the Hyperledger uh, forums. The role-based privileges are really a terrific feature of Hyperledger Fabric. We use those extensively um, to manage these roles. And in the case of the clinical supply area, You'll see here that we're typically looking at maybe 100 overall process flows. This is a master order process. You can see the physical and the data flows and the number of rules. And again, it's very critical that you blind all this information to people that don't need to see it um, so that they can't tell people. And as we move in this post-COVID world to direct to patient uh, clinical trials where we, if Marta participates in a trial, we'll mail the drugs directly to her house, um, you know, and, and maybe she would be visited by a nurse there, um, that uh, they would, again, continue to be blinded, but they would know how to work with them. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about the commercial side, uh, where we had Bruin Chain looking at the DSCSA objectives, and the idea that UCLA had was to focus on that last mile. You'll see it's inside the box here from the technician who's at the loading dock through to the practitioner um, and to assist those colleagues in performing robust checks, which means that they were gonna try during this process to look at one drug carefully and check every single one. Um, I would note as a sidebar that what we found was that the typical drug package was looked at by a UCLA um, colleague 99 times during the course of the week. So it was really amazing how often, how careful they were with this process. Enabled them to flag double counts and surface suspect transactions and enforce ground truth with exception handling. So if they thought something was not right, they could escalate it eventually to um, the FDA. But again, we don't want individual pharmacists you know, flooding the FDA with a lot of questions and worries. It gets routed through their managers at an appropriate, so it's the idea is to have private and escalating notifications. Uh, and again, the idea was to provide a real-time inventory uh, and quarantine at the refrigerator level. Um, so inventory, that means every 50 milliseconds, uh, there was an update. Quarantine means that there was an ability to hold back um, drugs until the, all of the DSCSA checks had been done.
Selected by the FDA for the DSCSA Pilot Project Program, UCLA Health and Ledger Domain joined forces to create Bruin Chain, a blockchain-based solution designed to track and trace changes in drug custody, form mandated DSCSA checks, and interoperate with trading partners. From the receiving bay to patient administration, caregivers scan the drug's unique 2D barcode using the Bruin Chain mobile app. This makes it possible to track the drug through the pharmacy at the stockroom level with every transaction logged on the blockchain. During its journey, the drug passes a series of checks until it's administered to the patient. Bruin Chain is also designed for exception handling. Under DSCSA and GS1 requirements, each barcode contains important information about the drug. When caregivers scan the barcode, this information is automatically extracted. New barcodes are routed to a trading partner for verification, and the drug is held back from being administered. At any time, the prescriber can view the progress of the drug through the pharmacy into the clinic. The trading partner can either verify the drug or indicate that there is a problem, such as a potential counterfeit. Trading partners can be provided with a real-time data stream on where their drug is and when that unit has been dispensed and even administered. If a drug is found to be suspect at any point, it is stickered and physically quarantined. If human review reveals a high risk of illegitimacy, Bruin Chain provides all the data needed to notify the FDA and trading partners. If the drug is verified as authentic, the prescriber gets a green light and can now administer with confidence. Beneath the surface, Bruin Chain passes messages and tracks changes in custody between six different roles. By combining blockchain with commercial off-the-shelf technology, Bruin Chain makes it possible to track and verify drugs in a busy hospital or neighborhood pharmacy. With Bruin Chain, doctors and pharmacists have a powerful new tool helping them in their mission to get the right drugs to the people who need them. Selected by the... So again, to summarize what we were looking at, um, we talked initially about the happy path where we're verifying with the manufacturer directly. And uh, in this case, it was Biogen in Switzerland. Um, but we had the ability to talk all these things. The FDA was mostly interested in what we would call the SAD path. And the idea with the SAD path is you've got four important checks. And if they're failing a check, then you get it's quarantined while you're checking. You can see that the, uh, the, the, the doctor is not able to administer. It's able to move. We're able to move the drug through those five steps, but he won't administer until all the checks have been done. And then the idea is we automatically generate what we call a trouble ticket or a 3911 flow after the form at FDA, where we have all the information ready to go. And then you can take a picture of the damaged item and, and report it to the appropriate person. So that's the story on the first five or six things we talked about up front. But now we have this big question is how do we onboard and authenticate the entire community? And so obviously we're all accustomed to these older systems. Uh, I like to talk about them as the janitor's key ring. We probably all went to school and the janitor had this incredible key ring where he could get into any classroom, the principal's office, any filing cabinet, and you were really relying on that one guy to be completely honest and never lose his keys. And what if he got sick? And what if somebody stole them? Well, you were in a lot of hot water. Um, and by the same token, that's what most people do. We call this the Death Star model, um, where big companies in the Fortune 500 have these sort of leaky uh, firewall models where, again, the system administrator can get in and touch everything and it's very dangerous. There's a reason why the federal government sets up these single points of failure and never reports out an audit as to whether they've had a pen test or somebody's gotten in and messed around. Uh, they don't want to admit how problematical these things are. And so essentially this old system of tin can telephones is still supporting most of these important supply chains. And it's a very sad state of affairs considering the fact that this modern technology is available. But we don't want to make the same mistakes that the 
school did when they gave the janitor that key ring. And so obviously what we wanna do as we onboard and authenticate this in community is to make good on what we call our lights out promise. And that is that at Ledger Domain or anybody who's hosting a Hyperledger community, the best practice is not to be able to look at the data, not to be able to look at the private storage, not to be able to look at the authenticating information for new members so that you can't sneak around and open these keys with yourself. So let's talk a little bit about what we're doing. What we wanted to do with XATP is to work with a big group of people like 10 Count Consulting um, and some of the other people in the industry to try to move fast and break things. And hopefully you've seen this uh, episode with Tesla, but this was the spirit of it. Can you try to break this glass, please? Yeah. Sure? Yeah. Oh my fucking god. So essentially then the goal is to enable all 250, 350,000 ATPs to get onto the system, to hold their own keys and to manage that process. And the idea is that we've talked about, there's depending on how you look at it, five or six classes of ATP, you've got manufacturers, wholesalers, large dispensers. You've obviously got combined entities like uh, Walmart that are uh, combining several of these classes together. But the idea is to build around what we call trust triplets, where each person, each ATP has a personal signatory, they have enterprise admin and an external validator. And the idea is that you're supporting a segregation of duties model. Those of you from the financial world will remember that in accounting, that the controller counts, the internal audit audits, and external audit samples to try to make sure that everything is done properly. And that's essentially how we would do that. As I said, we're currently piloting this project to sort of figure out exactly how it's going to work. And then we would hope by the end of this year to have an MVP and be able to scale in the new year. So what are we looking at here? The idea is that the serial number master database would have all the real drugs in their SAP ATTP or their trace link or something inside their four walls. And the idea would be that an XATP member would scan the barcode. They'd be able to request a verification, but the manufacturer would go into the database to try to understand whether they're credentialed or not. So this credentialing process is critical because you again, this KYC, know your customer, know your trading partner. And again, this person didn't necessarily buy this drug from the manufacturer. Um, they make the verification request, it's verified. They can then produce this verification certificate to another ATP who can check that report online this can accompany the drug. And then you know that you've got full supply chain assurance. And in this case, only one XATP member had to push the button and figure out how this worked. Coming back to this issue of how do we organize and use Hyperledger Fabric to drive this scalable and secure architecture, what we do is we basically leverage Hyperledger's certificate cascade 
where you can subdivide the certificate authority. So even if there's a master CA here that's run by, say, Ledger Domain or somebody else, maybe it's a nonprofit organization, they're then hiving it off. Maybe Walmart would run their own hosted org, prompt their key creation for each of their pharmacists, but they would hold their own CA. Um, if you were a smaller company, you might partition off, like a medium-sized drug company, you might partition off a small piece of the CA to let them manage their keys. And then what's cool about this, we've talked about this in the past with this oraculous model that we have, is we onboard the data with a relational database interop that we call oraculous. So it essentially, instead of having the manufacturer enter all of their drugs onto the Hyperledger blockchain, we basically let the first point of contact fish them out in a secure manner. So to summarize where we are then on these breakthrough features supporting healthcare and leveraging Hyperledger fabric and other Hyperledger tools, KitChain we talked about private and escalating notifications, having private storage. We originally used the plain vanilla Hyperledger fabric private storage We've now migrated that to a Minio-based uh, approach. Um, and we've also there nailed the data science. In Bruin Chain, we really focused on these role-based applications, adding 11 layers of supply chain abstraction on top of Hyperledger fabric, managing this exception handling, and providing the deep learning hooks that we talk about. In XATP, which we'll be talking about more openly, with the general public soon. We're leveraging Hyperledger Fabric for credentialed messaging, automated onboarding, having members hold their own key pairs, which may be done by other Hyperledger Fabric people, but it's the first we know of it. And these trust triplet models, where we enable us to continue to make good on the promise of a lights out experience for people that wanna leverage a Hyperledger Fabric community. And with that, um, Mike, do we have time for questions? Can we open it up? This is absolutely the time for questions. So thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, we have a chat question on here from Erica, and then we'll open it up to anyone for an open forum. She asked, uh, Erica, if you want to ask your, your question to, to Ben directly, yeah. uh, feel free to go ahead. Yeah, um, I was curious about the solution where the, the prescribers are scanning the products and wondering if that's actually been presented to the people doing it, like pharmacists and prescribers, because I'm a pharmacist and it's such a busy workflow in a community pharmacy and a hospital. I just, it seems like it'd be really overwhelming to have this extra step. I was just curious what people thought of that. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and I think it's an important question. Um, when we presented to the FDA, we specifically asked them to comment um, on the expectations of pharmacists under DSCSA. Um, and what UCLA's opinion was that was offered to um, the FDA was that they felt that there was a lot of value in doing this for opiates and for specialty pharma. Um, but for certain everyday items, um, one wondered whether it, it was necessary to uh, aggressively uh, um, uh, verify. Please talk to the FDA about this with opinions. Um, and so, Erica, we have not yet seen guidance on what frequency uh, the expectations are. Um, I think you're right. I think that um, in the community pharma, uh, I suspect we're going to feel uh, quite put upon to scan every uh, saleable unit. Um, but, you know, we'll have to see um, how that works out. So, again, as a software vendor, as a Hyperledger member, um, our job is to provide the functionality, not specify how often people do it. Um, but, um, you know, I think what we're going to be seeing over the next three years as we see the full implementation 
um, you know, is exactly how much compliance people are expecting. Uh, the related question is, you know, how much bad drug is really out there? That's another open question that people don't know the answer to. We've seen ideas that maybe 15 to 17% of prescriptions are not properly filled. Either the drug is expired or it's the wrong drug or there's some other confusion. Very hard to say, but I, I agree with you. There's many concerns on the part of all the stakeholders on how much this is gonna cost. And if you look at our paper, uh, we worked with, uh, with UCLA to articulate exactly what we thought the costs were. The final thing I'll add is we did ask that there be a bottle bill <laughs> and that pharmacists get a 10, 10 cent rebate on everything that they scan. And we'll see if the FDA signs up for that or not. Wow, okay, yeah, that's a great answer, thank you. Well, Any other questions from the group? I'm actually curious, so give me a second, we'll go back to, I wrote down something, so, okay, yeah. So within your scalable infrastructure, uh, or, or you describe about the app holds keys, verifiable credential and NDC lookup directories, have you thought about creative ways, so this is making it a certificate authority, have you ever thought of creative ways to make it a patient mediated type of exchange of, of holding or um, maintaining data through um, public key cryptography and how you'd be able to manage or assess that? Yeah, so to your point, let's unpack that. It's a great question. Let's unpack it into two separate questions. So on PKI, we're using all standard PKI and in our minds, um, we often say that, you know, Hyperledger fabric and blockchain in general is, you know, old wine and new bottles. And so, uh, you know, we're using relatively standard tools to achieve this. It's just a reorganization of standard PKI tools into something that's a little bit more secure and modern. Um, and so, yes, the keys in this case in our uh, test are currently being held on Apple's keychain. Uh, we would like at some point to consider moving to Apple's secure enclave or something similar like uh, Intel SGX. And then over time, uh, when we feel that technology is a little mature, we might move to a DID-based approach. Either way, the challenge with DIDs and everything else, and, and you take a, a large organization, you know, whether it's a Walmart, CVS, anybody like that, you know, they're going to want to have control over their employees. So it's not just enough to know that the PIC is in the paperwork, that is to say the pharmacist in charge of a pharmacy is listed at the state level, but he's also still in the good graces of his current employer. And so what's nice is that with this trust triplet that um, you know CVS or Walgreens can brick the phone, right? And block the person from doing their job uh, because they're no longer employed there. But by the same token, when the when the pharmacist's charge leaves the firm, he can unplug um, and erase his record of having been there. Um, and so to your point, yes, all of these tools in our minds, and part of the reason we're highlighting them today, is I we think they're very, very relevant for patient level information. Um, much of the patient level information has bigger files. Um, obviously this is 14 small data fields, uh, not a full genome, but um, I think that over time we're going to see more and more. We have been working with a number of players on COVID response. Some of the COVID response requests that have come in have been for up to 43 million people. Um, and so of course, you know, you want to be able to say that you can scale to those levels. Um, and that's exactly what this is meant to do. Great question. But I just did one clarifier, Mike, DSCSA only goes to the dispenser legally. Um, and so it would require additional regulation to push this initiative on this basis out to the patient. 
Thank you for clarifying. Um, any other questions from the group? I do have more to toss around if, if needed. Um, are you aware of the TEFCA working group, the ONC TEFCA working group, Ben? I've heard about it. I certainly don't consider myself an expert. Yes, yeah, so, so for everyone else who may not be aware, sorry for the background noise, but uh, TEFCA stands for Trusted Execution Framework and Common Agreements. And within there, uh, they're looking to create interoperability methods so that they could use certificate authorities to authenticate and, and give patients the ability to, uh, to ad adhere to the 21st Century Cures Act, which now isn't gonna truly be relevant for a number of years. Uh, how do you see what you're doing within certificate authorities uh, kind of opening up? And, and you mentioned about DIDs in particular, what are some of the drawbacks and challenges of DIDs that may need to be rectified in order for them to be used in these type of interoperable formats that, that, that are coming across uh, not only our federal entities, but in everyday uh, practices? Yeah, so in our minds, um, I would ask that we all sort of string the pearls in the following way, if you can just walk through the thought experiment with me. Um, what I would say is that in our minds, what our customers are looking for is responsible data stewardship um, and not an anarchy model. And so, you know, in the DID space, those are useful individual tools, um, but you know they have a more of an anarchistic model as a standalone. Um, and so if you're using them as to hook into a CA, that's great. And so for us, the way that we're organizing our thoughts is that say for medical records, um, you know, I can understand why there are people in the blockchain community that would want to go in and have total control over their medical record and where they would want to go in and erase the fact that they had COVID or erase their last STD because it's their medical record. Why can't they change it? Um, but I don't think that that's where the puck is really going. It's more about protecting your privacy and making sure that the stewardship is appropriate and that your data stewards, meaning if you're a patient at UCLA Health, that they're managing your data in a way that's appropriate to your rights and that they're sharing it out uh, appropriately um, and that they're managing it in a way that everybody can feel good about. It's not so much just sort of turning over the record um, and letting you run with it. Um, and so uh, that's where this role-based model is so important. So if you think about this XATB model, it's pluggable and unpluggable. So if you're an employee of a large pharmaceutical chain, you can unplug, but there's, they still have an obligation to keep those records for five years on the transactions that you signed off on. Um, but you can unplug your driver's license from that going forward. Um, so, and the same thing on the medical record side, the idea is that you wanna be able to participate in a clinical study or other sorts of deep learning. You want the hooks there, but you want it to be anonymized appropriately. And if you wanna move on to another facility, you can unplug from that, replug, or change your rights. But the idea is to manage the privileges, not necessarily to sort of unplug from everything and, 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 and you know, sort of move into an anarchistic model. So for us, um, when we're thinking about DIDs, we're thinking about how to hook them in to an existing certificate cascade or a new certificate cascade that we can help the community drive on a lights out basis. Um, and achieve their privacy objectives. Did that answer your question? It definitely did, because you mentioned about the drawbacks of, uh, I, the term anarchist isn't bad, right? I mean, I, I find that it, it, there's value into that because I personally and 99.9% .9 of folks <laughs> with their medical records probably don't want to 
have to do the data analyzing, the holding of large computational information of our records, right? That's why we have the stewards in place. So th that's, that's very clear on, on the drawbacks onto that. Um, there are some, I'm kind of going off kilter a little bit, so I apologize. There are some solutions out there that are um, claiming to create an NFT type model. And for those who may not be familiar with NFTs, they're non-fungible tokens uh, of health data information that's associated to your health and your biology, which could be genomic data, et cetera. And they're saying that one NFT could then be more, or you know, my Mike McCoy NF, uh, genomic NFT could be more valuable and selling that on a marketplace and then being able to have a marketplace be able to identify to take in my genomes for potential clinical studies or research or um, to evaluate mass groups of people and individuals. What is your take on marketplaces of information that are associated to care? Um, do you believe that there are maybe certificate authorities or um, companies that manage the rights and, and, and information as data that want to create marketplaces like that? Or is that just totally not feasible? And, and do you believe there's a model for that? I mean, I think there is a model for these things. And I think that Facebook has proven that aggregates can be valuable. Um, my guess as a personal conjecture uh, is that for most people, your medical record is worth no more than 20 bucks. Uh, if you have a rare disease, you know, there's somebody who's going to make a lot of money off of your care. Um, and so therefore, you're a valuable lead to them. And so if you're about to come down with, you know, kidney failure or something like that, somebody is going to be interested in learning about that. Um, I have a feeling and, you know, I, I mentioned my son, for instance, you know, I think if you have a health problem in your family, your goal is not to monetize it, it's to cure it, right? And so, you know, I understand that there's a class of people in the Silicon Valley universe that are always thinking about monetizing things. But I think if you're the parent of a, a sick child, your, your primary focus is on getting them better, not on getting a free toaster. That is totally fair. <laughs> and uh, I think also the part of it is people with diseases that, you know, they're, they're very much going to health systems often to help cure their ailment, uh, part of the thinking of you of having an NFT type of model is so they can mitigate the cost of them doing all you and using all these services that for for in certain jurisdictions of the government or, or your national um, landscape makes you charge X, X amount of money for that type of service. Um, and so for chronic, you know, conditions, et cetera. But, but yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very, because at the end of the day, we just want to be able to motivate others to want to take in this data information to help create faster cures, faster miracles, et cetera. Um, totally yeah, agree. A, and, and I think, Mike, that this COVID situation is an, also an opportunity for us to hold some of these concepts up to the light and, and see what works for people. I mean, clearly, uh, people have been willing to give up a little bit of safety, margin of safety, to get drugs out faster and vaccines out faster. Uh, clearly, people are willing to give up a little privacy in order to um, do contact tracing. Um, and so, you know, in our minds, this is all about achieving a balance. And I think what's great about this forum and these other ideas that you're talking about is that, you know, all of these fresh ideas will compete in the marketplace for ideas. And I think we'll come to center and as a group, you know, uh, find the right answer for everybody. Uh, it's a learning process. I think that, um, you know, just as these centralized um, you know, models made sense to people in the past, and now we see them as a single point of failure. I think we'll continue to make progress. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I think uh, all of these ideas are competing for oxygen, and we'll have to see over the next year with COVID and the years that follow with personalized medicine, 
you know, which ones really work for people. But it, it's an exciting time to be engaged in healthcare and think about all these new things that are happening. And it's amazing to see these vaccines move so quickly. Um, hopefully they'll be as safe as we all imagine they can be. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a terrific time to, again, hold these fresh ideas up to the light. Jack Carr, you had a, a question? And thank you for your response, Ben. Jack Carr, you mentioned a, a question on chat. and then, Yeah, there you go. You're on mute. You're on mute, my friend. You're on mute if you can hear me. So. You're on mute. There we go. I still can't hear you, unfortunately. Do you have a specific mic or AirPods or something that are on? Can't hear you yet. Well, I'm going to answer the question he's posed or talk of those on. So he's okay. talking about two things in his thing, which is asynchronous real time and interoperability. Um, so on the interoperability side, uh, there's been a lot of discussion on blockchain to blockchain interoperability. Um, in all honesty, we've been focusing a lot more on relational to blockchain uh, interoperability. Uh, and we've uh, designed a number of novel approaches and we've leveraged grpc type approaches when we can um, in our public pilots we typically focus for those of you that are looking more carefully on using fake data um, and uh, human readable messages so we can test those things out um, in the real world obviously it's real data uh, and more often machine to machine um, we're big fans of gRPC, but we're also big fans of security overlays to tighten up these APIs. We feel like the API models can be a little insecure. Um, in the US, um, we do not typically have to rely on asynchronous um, technologies. Fortunately, almost everybody is up and running on a semi-synchronous model. Uh, the big thing uh, if you want to call it that, and you saw this in the Bruin chain thing, is that quite often it does take time for the drug company to respond on verification. Um, in this day and age, they're not quite up to uh, high availability yet there uh, in the verification router services. Um, and so that's why we built in these layers where you can continue to move the drug through the UCLA system and only have to worry about verification at the last step. So we're currently running Hyperledger Fabric on a 50 millisecond latency. Um, and then we generally see round trip latencies of about 200 milliseconds. Um, so again, for pharmacy, that's pretty manageable. I think Erica's points were well taken and you will see it in our paper. If the pharmacist has to scan it a second time, um, because they had to put it down and wait. Uh, it's very disruptive to their workflow. Um, we quoted a 17 cent disruption in terms of time. Erica might value her time more, but that was our best guess if you can look at our calculations. And FDA is well aware of that. And so to move towards truly real time um, responses, which I'd call in the 250 millisecond time frame. That's what's going to be required to really not disrupt the pharmacist workflow. Hopefully that answered your question, Jayakar. Anyone else? Well, Mike, thanks very much. This has been awesome. I appreciate the time. Congratulations on your new role. And is any other final questions you have before we sign off or thoughts? Nothing else from me. Nothing else from me at all. Uh, I appreciate you taking the hour to speak to our group and uh, for the engaging session. Um, yeah, just to, for everyone's notice, we are going to meet in two more weeks. 
we potentially have a guest speaker. Uh, I haven't got them to qualify yes yet, but uh, we may have another guest presentation coming up on, oh goodness, what is that date in two weeks? It is the, on the 10th of, or sorry, the 9th of December. So uh, I will be sending out that information by this week and uh, thank you all for, for coming. Any other questions about the group or things for Ben or, or other things within the healthcare special interest group. Thanks All right. very much. Thank you everyone, have a good day Thanks. and happy Thanksgiving for our United States friends. You too, bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Happy Thanksgiving, Mike. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Oh, Marta, you're too kind from across the pond. <laughs> Cheers. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.